Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 169, recorded on December 20th, 2020. I'm Chris. I'm Wes. And I'm Joe. Hello, gentlemen, and Joe, welcome back to the show. It's good to be here. Now, it is that time of year where we look back at what we said would happen in 2020, and we predict what will happen in 2021, and to help us go through those previous predictions, Joe's back. And so, since you're our guest of honor, Joe, we're going to start with you. Uh, Last year, you predicted that in 2020, we'd be able to buy a RISC-V-based single board computer that's capable of running a full Linux desktop, maybe uh, Debian and XFCE, perhaps, and it will cost no more than the most expensive Raspberry Pi. Unfortunately, this did not happen. No, clearly I was wrong about this, although I listened to it and I did predict an 8 gigabyte RAM uh, Raspberry Pi, so maybe half a point for that. Oh. Yeah, accidental half point there. Um, I, you could tell it's a true Joe prediction, too, because it's got XFCE. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Well, that's what he would be running with it, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the 8-gig pie, that's interesting. Was that just a casual mention? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, all right. Um, this one, I'm kind of curious to know what you guys think. I'll, I'll do mine. I said Richard Stallman w- would reemerge on the talk scene, uh, not necessarily affiliated with any particular group, But he'd be like a mercenary for free software out there and about. And we'd see him sort of pop up a little bit more. Interesting. Do you think I got that one? Okay, well, this year it's a little hard to tell because the scene is a bit different. I don't know. I don't don't know that he's at least anywhere near as prominent as he once was. He has done some conferences, like Emacs Conf 2020. He was there and he did a couple of talks there. One, um, like, AMA type thing, which is on YouTube, which I watched the other day. So he's definitely not totally disappeared. He definitely did come back. And that was what we were talking about, was the whole political angle of it, that he'd kind of been cancelled and now he's kind of come back and there hasn't been as much of a stink about it as I thought there might be. Yeah, that's true. There really hasn't been. I I guess I did kind of, although I didn't predict that there would be, I did kind of assume there would be. (laughs) I think we all did. So I'm kind of getting this one, it sounds like, then? I think also maybe if you look at it as, did did Richard Stallman totally fade away? The answer is no. And I think in that spirit, yeah, you get a point. Yeah. All right, well, on to Joe's next prediction. By this time next year, there'll be a license that solves the AWS problem while still being open source. Now, this is interesting. There's a lot of definitions here, particularly open source and the AWS problem. Do you think you got this one, Joe? Not quite. I think almost. The AWS problem, of course, is that the likes of Amazon are taking open source software and selling it as a service and not contributing financially or even code back to the original projects. And so we had various attempts last year at it, and I think we had a pretty good one this year, which was the timescale license, which is pretty close, but it's not quite open source. So I don't think I can claim a full point here. Yeah, timescale does get close, but I kind of, yeah, I don't think it was quite the spirit of it. So I, I tend to agree there. There still is that overall AWS problem, not fully solved. I guess this next year, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. All right, Chris, I think you're up now. All right, so this one, it seemed like everything was in place. There are almost years of little hints leading up to this prediction, and I thought it was going to pop this year. Uh, but I don't know if this, I don't, I don't think I can make that claim. I said that NVIDIA would show various types of support. Uh, maybe it was code, documentation, developer time, etc. that would enable the Nouveau driver to become really functional, close to fully functional for basic daily driver uses with the NVIDIA graphics card. Uh, But it just did not materialize. I I even saw rumors and suggestions that certain NVIDIA developers were having conversations with certain Red Hat developers to make some of this work, like on the DL. Uh But nothing I can point to officially and say, yeah, they stepped up and they really enabled the project. Yeah, weren't we expecting some sort of conference talk that ultimately got canceled? But it it seemed like this was in the works, and I guess just never realized. Yep, there was a talk that was scheduled. Um, there was, if you go back to 2019, there were several announcements about how how documentation was going to get delivered. There was a GitHub re- repo set up, and it just all went nowhere. Um, and you got to wonder what happened. And in the meantime, AMD just to, seems to have refined their strategy on Linux. You know, we had Michael Arbel on recently, and he was talking about what a good year it was for AMD on Linux. And you look at, like, launch day with the 6800 series, and it's pretty solid on Linux. 
And then you look over at NVIDIA and they've just really done nothing to improve the experience. They've continued to make uh, their driver and they continue to refine that. It does perform well if you're willing to jump through the proprietary hoops, of course. Yep. But nothing to really address the fact that AMD and Intel just have it all baked into the Linux kernel now. And that's what I was really hoping to see. Some kind of help and support there that would make this thing more functional. Uh, and it just it just didn't happen. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get a $100 60-day credit towards your new account and go there to support the show. Linode is our cloud hosting provider. All of us here on the show, we use Linode for our personal stuff and all of our business stuff. And I like that they're independently owned. You know, that really makes a difference. I, I trust that they're going to be around for a long time. And they started forever ago in 2003 as one of the first companies in cloud computing. And there's so many little nice features that you don't even really have to worry about. Like, for example, I was setting up a new rig, and I was I was just sending a ton of data because it was going to be the central node in this mesh network that I was setting up. And so I was just sending a bunch of data to get it all synced up. So when I turned everything on, it, it would have all of the files. And uh, about 15 minutes into this process, maybe 20 minutes into the process, I get a message from Alex. He says, what is going on? What are you doing? Because I had these little threshold alerts set up that were just perfect little reminders that, hey, something's worth checking in on here. Your box is doing something a little unusual. And the number one thing that I know from running servers in production is that is a great way to tell that something is wrong, that somebody has owned your box, something's going on, or you have a process gone haywire, or something's sinking that you didn't expect to sink. These thresholds let you check in on things like CPU or bandwidth transfer in my case. It generates a nice email. It says, hey, you're not in trouble. It's no big deal. But this just meets the threshold which you set. And so we're letting you know that you've exceeded that. And I and it was really kind of cool because I thought, you know, if we got that on the matrix server, we'd know something was wrong. That would be a sign that we should go check in on that kind of thing. Or something was going really, really right. <laughs> it's a party on that matrix server, which we also host on Linode, of course. So go check them out because with that $100 credit, you can really build some awesome infrastructure with some great tools around it to really make it run solid for you. So it's stable, it's fast. They have 11 data centers around the world you can choose, whatever's close to you or maybe close to your clients. And of course, that dashboard makes it easy to tie it all together. And unlike entry-level hosting services that lock you into their platform, Linode gives you full backend access to customize and control your server to fit your needs. And they support tools like Kubernetes and Terraform, which great opportunity to learn or great opportunity to plug it into your existing management system. So go to linode.com slash LAN. You go there, you get that $100 60-day credit towards the new account, and you support the show. You make it possible for independent media to give away their content for free by going to linode.com slash LAN. Okay, so I'm not even officially on this show anymore, so I'm not going to be making any predictions. So that's a good excuse for me to just be the unofficial referee. So you two have got to do two each, I reckon. So who's going to go first, Wes? Yeah, all right, I'll do that. This this first one doesn't necessarily make me happy to say, but I'm, that's not how this game is played, right? I'm going to predict that Mozilla kills Pocket. Pocket, huh? Yeah. I, you know, it just never really felt like a great fit. They never open sourced it, and it doesn't really seem like they've done anything with it. Now, I'm not opposed. I've actually used Pocket. Having a nice read it later service is pretty handy, and it makes sense as a feature in a browser, really. They just, they're like so many other things, it's rotting away. And with the, you know, the downsizing, the new version of Mozilla, I just don't know that there's a ton of effort that they would have anyway to go in there. So we'll see. The thing that makes me think this might not happen is that just the other day I had a new installation of Linux and a new Firefox without my profile or anything. And the first thing it said was, hey, try Pocket. So they're still heavily promoting it to new users. So I can see it, but I can also not see it. I think we won't see it open sourced either way. Isn't that just like the only exit strategy they have for Pocket that doesn't piss everyone off? Yeah, I think so. If they just kill it and they fail to open source it, I think that's even worse PR for them. Mm. Um, but I could totally see your resources argument here. They don't really have the resources. They haven't really got a solid way to monetize it in a way that's moving the needle for them financially at all. So they may have to focus in on what they can do well and what they can generate a profit from. I could see Pocket not being on that list. But how they handle that, that's going to be critical. And you're not saying they're going to open source it. You're saying they kill it. I say they kill it. They wind it down. Uh, it, there's some sort of timeline where it's going to be going away. All right. We're locking that one in. Um, so mine is a little safer of a bet than yours. 
I predict that at least three traditional CentOS-style clones will ship their quote-unquote 1.0 in 2021. All right, well, uh, I think that's where we'll first need the ref. What are we counting as uh, 1.0? Is that just um, like a release that's ready for the general public to consume and deploy production-wise? Yeah. I don't know if they may call it they may call it 8.0 to make it clear what version it is, but right. mm. um, it'll be their first public release. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's fair enough. Are we saying three new clones here, so we're not counting Oracle's one and stuff? So that's the tricky thing is I, I'm wondering um, what qualifies or not, and I'm thinking it's three Rocky Rocky Linux or whatever, Rocky OS. That would count. Um, but And like a restart of scientific Linux I think would count, but I don't think cloud Linux counts mm. or Oracle because they've already been shipping for a while now. So I'm saying three clones. Okay. So some at least it seems like some new clones would need to be. Well, one new clone by my count at right. the moment, but I'm not, you know, somewhere in the mix. The thing is, uh, the reason why I think this is a little tiny bit risky is these are supposed to be enterprise distros. And so going slow and getting it just right is sort of in their nature. And so it may be too aggressive of a window to say in 20, maybe they don't actually ship something until 2022. Maybe they don't actually even ship something until... I don't. I don't know. Um, December. I mean, that would be my idea. Here's where my background on this was: is they got to get something shipped by December, right? Because in December, the end of December, 2021, that's when traditional CentOS upgrades, updates go away. That's when support dies for CentOS as people knew it, and people either need to switch to stream, which I think is what the majority of people will need to do. Or they'll have to come to some sort of decision where they do one of these conversion scripts and convert to some fly-by-night distro. But I think that's your target. If you if you miss that December window, you're going to miss the majority of the market. Right. That's when you need to be ready with something that people could, in theory, actually switch to. And um, that's my prediction is that three of them will be at their production-ready state by then. By this time, next year, basically. Right now is where we're recording. Interesting. All right. What's your next one then, Wes? Well, I suppose I'm keeping in the theme of maybe not that likely, but I'm doing it anyway. Ubuntu ships Systemd home D. Now, not Fedora, but Ubuntu here? Well, Fedora felt almost too certain. Like, that's that's just going to happen, right? At some point, it's going to end up in a Fedora release. Maybe not the default, but but there. So I think maybe by the next, what, the one in 2104, um, Systemd home D will be available. You can try it out pretty easily on Ubuntu. And then by uh, by the fall 2110... It'll be online by default. That's that's what I'm predicting. Now, it might not be that they've engaged all the features. You know, it's not, it doesn't have to use all of it or radically change, but just that it's there and it's running by default in a regular Ubuntu desktop install. So could we say the key qualifier is if the user account exists when the home folder exists, that's using systemd homed? Yeah, and, the, you know, you've got that part of the distribution of systemd installed. Okay, just installed? Just installed? Yeah, installed and configured on the system by default. Okay, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I could definitely see it more likely with Fedora, but if I were canonical, maybe I'd want to like claim a little recognition for being willing to do a little more cutting edge. And so maybe this is something they'd seriously look into and maybe try to figure out if it's shippable before they do the LTS. And they, That's exactly right. That would be the time. Get it in there before the 2204 LTS that's coming up. Yeah, and they could always pull it. They could put it in 2110 and then if it doesn't work out, pull it and go back to regular home directory for... 2204. Yeah. Yeah, I like this one, actually. I would like to see it. It's neat, and I'd like to do a little more playing with systemd homebd, honestly. I'm going to save a, an Ubuntu prediction for Linux Unplugged. I got one that I'm setting aside. I, th- I, feel, like, I feel like I'm going to save it because I want, I want you to have that space in this. So you'll be the one making the Ubuntu prediction in this episode. So what's your other one then, Chris? All right, this next one, this one could this one could screw me like the uh, Nouveau driver did because this is one where I'm reading all the tea leaves, I'm seeing all of the uh, activity leading up to this year, and I think, I predict, the Bcache FS will be mainlined in 2021. I would really like to see this, a nice high-performance file system, fantastic for NVMe drives and workstations. You know, when you don't need everything that ButterFS or ZFS can do, but you still want a modern, high-performance, really awesome, well-designed file system, BcacheFS. And it, it it's getting there. It's getting there, but like so many things, that that final getting it over the final hump to get it in the kernel can just take forever, like we saw with WireGuard. Yes. I mean, there's a high bar of entry for the kernel, and rightfully so. 
Yeah, and they've just did another round of reviews for inclusion in October. Um, and it, it, it's looking like it's on a good trajectory, but it's it's by far it's not a sure thing yet. It's not it's not a sure bet yet. I'm almost glad of that, honestly, because with file system development, like I, we don't need that to be rushed. Like just take the time, get it right, because I think once it is in the kernel, you know, if it assuming it makes it there, that's when people will actually really start trying it out. You're not going to compile a module of a file system that you might use that you don't know and isn't trusted, but once it's blessed and actually available by default, yeah, all right, I'm switching. There are still, as Kent Overstreet puts it, the main developer, a few bugs remaining, including, quote, kernel oopses <laughs> with uh, Z standard compression, um, some of the erasure code not being quite stable, but pretty much everything else, replication, compression, checksumming, encryption, all looking really solid. And another good sign that's helping get BcacheFS over uh, the inclusion hump is a veteran file system developer Dave Chiner has jumped in to help with testing Bcash, and he's even found a couple of things by like throwing it through a dual socket m- uh, motherboard, which looks at some of these checksums and does a little bit of different behavior than everything on one chip, and he actually uncovered some scalability issues where BcacheFS wasn't quite staying up to snuff as, say, like something like XFS is currently doing, and they're working on those things. And I think probably by summer, they're going to have all that stuff wrapped up. So I, I don't know. I don't know, Wes. We'll see. I don't. I don't know if it's going to get included then. But I think by the time we're recording next year, uh, this kind of episode, I, I really hope to see Bcash FS in the mainline kernel. It may not be shipping in distros yet, but it's going to be upstream. It's going to be mainlined. My next question then is, how long after it gets mainlined before we've switched the studio? <laughs> Linux.ting.com. It's the next generation of Ting Mobile, and it's here. I've been a customer for over eight years, and I can tell you there has never been a better time to try out Ting. And when you go to Linux.ting.com, you get $25 off. It's now the smarter choice for everybody. They have unlimited data plans at $45 a month. Whether you need 2 gigs or 20 gigs, whatever it might be, there's a perfect Ting plan for you now. And they've made some big improvements there. But no need to worry, because that's really it. The only thing that's changed is just lower monthly phone bills. You still get access to Ting's award-winning customer service and nationwide LTE and 5G. And you know what else? No contracts. No contracts. No contracts ever. And now Ting Mobile customers can choose from three different plans based on your data needs. And you'd be impressed with how much you can get done through the Ting interface. The dashboard takes care of just about everything you'd ever need. I don't, I, I don't understand why the rest of the industry doesn't catch up to where Ting's at. I mean, I'm talking about even like porting over and bringing a new device. You can do it all through the website. And pretty much any phone will work with Ting. So just head to linux.ting.com to check your current phone. You create an account. You pick the plan that's right for you, and then like magic, Elfs will send you a SIM card that you pop into your phone, and you get activated, and you're going in just a few minutes. And one of the brilliant things about Ting is there's multiple carriers you can choose from, depending on what works best in your area. And that also means that if you need to be mobile, or you need multiple different carriers, or you need to maybe you need to move, you can always pick and choose what's going to work best for you. So go see what it's like to cut your phone bill in half. It's never been easier with Ting. So get started by going to linux.ting.com. This is the next generation of Ting Mobile. It's here, and I'm really impressed with what they've managed to do. And you can get $25 off when you go to linux.ting.com. Well, it wouldn't be a Linux Action News predictions episode without some Bitcoin talk. And, oh boy, howdy, with all the news this week, it's more relevant than ever. Yeah, it's already dropped about $800 since we started recording. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, boy. This is a tricky one. Uh, So why don't we review what we said would happen? And then we're going to talk about if we can even predict the future, um, because I think that's a conversation in itself. Joe, you said that it would get to uh, 19,000 as a high. I said 22,000. It actually got as high as 24,000. Yeah, and it's possible that it could go even higher by the end of the year after we've recorded this. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, for the low end, you predicted it would go as low as 4K. Uh, I predicted 5K, and it, it looks like that's about where it was, was 5K, somewhere around there for the 2020 low. Wow. Yeah, around March time, it got to about there, so you were pretty spot on there. I was close, though. Boy, that, right now, looking back at $5,000, that seems like quite a deal. You know, because you don't have to buy a full Bitcoin. You just buy however much you can afford. Yeah, yeah. get like a couple hundred bucks worth of Bitcoin. Back then it was $5,000, and that would have paid off right now at this point in time. 
Um, not any kind of advice, of course. I'm just looking at that thinking maybe I should have maybe I should have done something there. Um, then we said, okay, here's what it's going to be on December 1st, 2020. Joe, you said it'd be 7K. Uh, I said it'd be 14K. It actually turned out to be around 19K. So much higher than either one of us were thinking. And I thought I was going a little high because I thought if the low was five and I said it was going to get all up to 14, I was like, well, that's a pretty big growth. Right. Is this a spiky growth or is it more of a sustained? Yeah. Well, I listened back to that predictions episode and what I was talking about was wanting stability. I didn't want it to have this massive high. I thought that if it dropped to about four or five and then crept its way up to seven, seven and a half, that's what I would want to happen. I want just slow and steady growth, not this crazy up and down. But here we are talking about it at, you know, 23, 24,000 having beaten last year's record and crucially that 20,000 barrier because it came close earlier in the year to 20,000 and just didn't quite make it. And that's a psychological barrier to people. And I, I kind of didn't want it to break that yet. I wanted it to have a, a sustained period of being around about 20 and then for it to break through and then start climbing. I, I, I just The volatility is going to be its undoing and ultimately will be the undoing of its value, I think. It's hard to say because I don't really know how to really predict a currency that has a limited supply. And because people are losing their coins and, you know, their wallets, like there's always there's always less and less Bitcoins and there will only be a finite amount ever made. So while new ones are getting mined, there's also ones that are getting lost and there's a limit on that. So I do wonder if that doesn't play strange things with the value as well. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it's it's ripe for speculation and people are happy to do that. And what we what we noticed is it just took off again like a rocket. It was it was bouncing around, bouncing around, and then boom, 19,000. Tipped at 20, came down a bit, and then bam, all the way up to 24,000 as of this morning. Um, and as we record, it's $23,799.80. Not that I'm checking. But it's still, it's crazy. It's still crazy. But I... I have noticed a huge shift in how many normals know about Bitcoin. Everyone in my family knows that Bitcoin is a thing. They might not understand it, but there was, uh, I think, a large adoption of Coinbase, and then the Cash App made it really easy to buy Bitcoin. Right. It's in the hands of folks. You might not understand anything about how digital wallets work or blockchain, but uh, hey, here's here's something you can buy. I had the Cash App set up already so I could, you know, hey, hey, here's my half a lunch or or whatever. Like I've used it. I've used it for all kinds of like quick little ways to send money. So I had everything plumbed already. And when they rolled out Bitcoin support, it was just a button on my phone now to to buy some Bitcoin. I, I actually haven't used it, but I bet a lot of other people have. And, and you know, you're sitting there, you're watching this thing go up. You buy a little bit of it. Um, and I think making it easier every step of the way has accelerated adoption and made it understandable to some degree by the normals. Uh, I told this story on air before, but I actually got a telegram from my mom about a month ago asking me what I thought about investing in Bitcoin and and uh, talking to me about Bitcoin. My mom, who I've never had a conversation with my mom about Bitcoin before, she found it on her own. And uh, I mean, that really to me was a sign that I, I kind of feel like, I feel like it's impossible to predict, but I think it's, I think this year it's stuck, it, 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 it's here now. It's sticking around. I think people who actually speculate on commodities like gold and silver are now keeping, I mean, I hear this all the time on the economics YouTube channels I watch. Oh, I have about 5% of my portfolio in crypto. It's, yeah, it's just a new way to diversify your account. It doesn't seem like we're really using it to actually buy that many products or services these days. At least uh, I haven't seen that much of it. I mean, there, there's some, right? It still exists. But yeah, it seems now more it's a, it's a new investment vehicle side hustle. So how do you predict something like this? Can you predict something? You make wild guesses and see what sticks. Because if, if you look at the volatility we just saw in the last couple of months, we could stay this exact price all year long, and then in November it could, it could, it could jump up to 40000 I mean, it's just, it's wild. But I do think once 20000 was crossed, because I think every time what you're doing is you're setting a new expectation of what Bitcoin's value is, because it's all yes. made up anyways. Right. And once you get used to that idea, then you're more comfortable paying that for it, and that's part of how that gets established. And the longer it stays at these higher prices, the more that becomes the new floor. Like, it just never goes below a certain amount now, and and it ultimately ends up higher than where it 
you know, like, so when it crashes, it usually rebounds over time higher than when it originally crashed. So I, I can't make a prediction here, but I feel like we're going to look back at, at 24,000 and think it was quaint. I guess you're telling us to buy. <laughs> I, I just think it's reached that point where it's not going away. It's nature, the blockchain, the fact that it's open source, the fact that there's all these applications being built on top of it. And now that it's so commonly known, it's becoming easier and more accessible for the normals. Um, yeah, I think it's unless unless a government like the size of the United States just decided to try to shut it down as much as possible, it's not going away. It, you're right. They, people aren't buying goods with it. But a lot of people are also storing silver. And, you know, you think about it, when people buy gold and silver, some of them are not even actually, they don't actually own the metal, right? They're, they're buying rights to the metal that's stored somewhere stored else. Elsewhere, right. It, it, what's the difference? At least one could be cryptographically proven. <laughs> <laughs> well, I started to get people asking me about this when it was approaching 20,000 again. And should I buy or not? And my advice to anyone would always be only invest what you can afford to lose. And this is a long-term investment if you are going to do it. But I said to them back in late November, early December, if it breaks the 20,000 barrier, then it's going to go to the moon, essentially. If we can break that psychological barrier, which we now have, and we're at 23, 24-ish, I think it's going to go a lot higher over the next year. So if you've got money to lose and to risk and to bet, essentially, then you could do worse, I think. Well, now that we're all just looking at the ticker, it's time to wrap this episode up. But go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. And check out my show, Late Night Linux, latenightlinux.com, if you want to hear more from me. We'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you next week. See you later.